My name is James Harrington, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to share with Girl Scouts a little bit about my job, what I like about it, and how someone who's interested in pursuing this type of work could go about doing that. I currently work at the University of California, Santa Barbara, UCSB for short, in a department called Residential and Community Living. This type of department exists at pretty much any university that offers students the ability to live on campus, uh, but it can go by a lot of different names. Sometimes you'll see it called residence life or university housing, but in all, uh, they all have a pretty similar mission in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. Um, essentially, what we do is we oversee all of the university owned housing here, and we try to make sure that all the students who are living here have a safe place to live, sleep, eat, study, and make friends. The residents who live in our buildings are all college students, so they are primarily here to get a degree, otherwise they wouldn't be living with us. So we do whatever we can to ensure that we're meeting their most basic needs so that they can focus on being successful students. My specific role in my department is helping to oversee an apartment building of about 300 apartments and about 800 residents. Uh, along with myself, I have a supervisor who helps me co-supervise the community. I work with a large staff of maintenance workers who make sure that the community is clean and fix any maintenance issues. And I supervise a staff of student workers who are called resident assistants, or RAs for short. So RAs have an awesome job where they get to be peer advisors to the other students in the building. Uh, because they're currently students as well, a lot of students are more likely to go to their RAs with issues that they might be having rather than going to a professional staff member. The RAs get to know their residents and can directly relate to their experience of being students because they are currently students as well, which can help them more effectively help their residents through any issues that they're having. The RAs also get a certain amount of money to plan events that they think their residents will be interested in, which can be really fun for the RAs to bring in their own interests and share it with the students they work with. So some examples of fun events that my RAs have done are Halloween decorating competitions, um, group hikes or sunset walks, open mic nights, karaoke nights, tons of movie nights, tons of pizza. Um, I had an RA who put on an event called Coco and Coco where they drank hot cocoa, and they watched the Pixar movie Coco. So those are all examples of really fun events. The sky is really the limit, and I think it's one of the most fun aspects of uh, this job. Um, and then, of course, because we're at a university, we have plenty of educational or professional development events as well. So things like resume workshops, helping people with like interview skills, or events where students can meet professors in a more casual setting. All of that stuff is really popular with students. Um, as the supervisor of the RAs, I mainly provide support for the things that they do and help keep them on track. So because the RAs act as peer mentors for a really wide assortment of issues, that means that they sometimes have residents come to them with really simple questions or issues, but sometimes have residents approach them with some really serious things that they're facing that RAs might not be fully equipped to handle on their own. Um, some of these issues include things like feeling unsafe in their living space. Um, they might be struggling with their mental or physical health or having serious disagreements with their roommates that require an action plan to really address all of their concerns. Um, that is generally where I would step in and handle some of those higher level issues. So along with that, I'm here to offer guidance to the RAs in their programming to make sure that it will be successful and effective for our community. I try to hold the RAs to deadlines to make sure that they're getting fundraising for events, um, that they're buying all of the necessary materials, that they're booking the right spaces, buying the right food. Um, we always want our events to be inclusive of the entire community. So that can look like making sure that we're offering vegan or gluten-free options at events, or making sure that the program is accessible to students with disabilities. There's really a wide range of things to keep in mind when planning an event for a community of hundreds of students with hundreds of different backgrounds. And so it's my job to act as a second opinion for the RAs and to help them see any details that they might have missed when they were first planning it. So that's a general overview of my job um, and why this type of role exists at a university. So something else that I want to talk to you about is how I ended up in this position and how someone who's interested in this type of work could get here. Um, so a little bit about me. I grew up in the East Bay area in California, about half an hour away from San Francisco. Um, after I graduated from high school, I decided to enroll as a student at UCSB. 
And while I was a student here, I had so many interests and very little idea of what I wanted to do after college as a career. Um, I knew that I really liked helping people one on one uh, in a setting where it's sort of like, you know, tell me your issues and we'll work through them. Um, I really enjoyed that. But the only experience I had with that was um, in high school. I worked at a tutoring program. So I wanted to get more experience like that. So while I was a college student, I got involved as a mentor at a local high school where um, I would work with students to help them focus on their schoolwork and help them sort through any personal or academic issues that they were having. And I really absolutely loved that. Like I loved that experience, loved working with the students. So because I loved it so much, I used that to sort of um, figure out other jobs that I wanted to do. So I started working as a summer orientation student employee. So I helped incoming freshmen acclimate to the university. Um, I became a tutor again. And then in my last year of college, I became an RA. So the same position that I now supervise. Um, and I was working fully with first year college students. It was fun. It was like getting a second, like first year college experience. So all of these experiences led me to figure out that I was passionate about serving others. I love being a resource uh, where I can use my experience at the university to help new students adapt and find their place here. And that's what led me to this position. And it is really a joy to work. I have fun at my job every day. Um, if I was talking to someone who was interested in this type of job, some of the skills that are necessary include being able to listen to other people in a non-judgmental way, um, asking questions to help people figure out tough situations, being a problem solver, um, specifically when it comes to connecting students with resources from all around campus, um, and in the community, you want to be able to figure out which resource will help the most in a given situation or who I could connect a student with in this moment to help them get where they need to be. Time management and prioritization is another really big one. So for instance, when you have a lot of different tasks that you need to complete and you need to decide how much time to spend on something and what order to complete those tasks. Like sometimes, I don't know, I might have like a big event that's going to start in an hour but then right as I'm going to it, I need to talk to a student who comes to me like crying about something that's going on in their life. And then I need to quickly decide, OK, how can I best serve the student? while Also making sure that um, the other things I'm responsible for are getting done. And then leadership. Leadership is another really big one uh, because so much of my role is supervising students who are in positions with a lot of responsibility placed on them and they don't have quite as much training as like I have being a full time staff member. Um, I need to make sure that I'm providing adequate support and checking in with the RAs to make sure that they are balancing their schoolwork and their job and their personal life. It's a lot to juggle as a full time student. I know that all of you who this video is directed at are pretty far away from the point where you're working or even thinking about college. So along with the information that I've shared with you about what I do and why I do it, I want to provide you with some skills and things to think about that relate directly to what I do, but that can also be helpful in your day to day lives, regardless of what age you are. So there are so many things that I've learned from working with students and doing this job that I wish I had learned when I was a lot younger. One of those things is how to build healthy relationships between yourself and those around you. A lot of students who I work with are fresh out of high school. Often they are living in a room with one or two other roommates and they might have never had to share a room before. Um, as I said earlier, my main job here is to make sure that I'm supporting the residents to solve any issues that might get in the way of their academic success in college. And as you might imagine, if you're constantly having conflict with the people who you live with, uh, it can make it really difficult to focus on your schoolwork. So helping students develop healthy relationships in my community is a really large focal point. The reason that this is important in your life is that no matter who you are, you have relationships. So this might be between you and a friend, you and your parents, your siblings, your aunts, your uncles. Um, classmates, even between you and the strangers who you only interact with for a few minutes and then never see again. And as you grow older, you'll generally only have more relationships to navigate. Um, so it's incredibly important that you learn how to make these relationships healthy. It will make you happier, it'll make you more confident, and it'll make you a better friend to the people around you as well. So when I say healthy versus unhealthy relationships, what am I talking about? On a basic level, are you happy when you are around these people? 
I'm going to ask you to participate in a little activity with me, and it might be difficult, so just bear with me. Um, think about one of your friends who you spend a lot of time with. I know that obviously during the current pandemic, it can be really difficult to see your friends in person. So feel free to think about what it was like last year, or maybe it's someone who's still in your bubble or someone who you're able to talk with on the phone or video chat, something like that. So think about that friend and ask yourself these questions. Does this friend support the things that you like? Do you feel comfortable telling them about the things that you enjoy doing and you know that they'll support you and be happy for you? For example, maybe you really like to read. Do you feel like you can talk to your friends about that and they will happily listen? So if you find that you have things that you really enjoy doing, maybe you really like playing a sport or you play a musical instrument or maybe you really like a certain kind of music or a TV show, um, and if you find that you're embarrassed to tell your friends about it because you're worried they'll judge you, it might be a sign that they aren't very supportive friends, that they aren't, aren't really acting in the best way. So another thing that goes along with this is, do they ask you questions about yourself? Do they ask you how you're doing? How was your weekend? Let's say that you play soccer and you had a really big tournament that you had told your friend was coming up and you told them that you were really excited or really nervous about it. Would they ask you, how did that tournament go? Asking questions is a really important part of showing people that you care about getting to know them and care about what's going on in their life. Question number three, okay. Do you feel like you can trust your friends with your secrets? Are you worried that if you told them something serious, that they wouldn't necessarily keep it between you and them. Trust is a really important part of any relationship and it's important that you feel that you can trust the people who you're close to. All right, next question. Do you feel like your friends help you be a good person? Do your friends bring out the best in you? So obviously what makes a person good is very subjective. You can have different opinions on that, but when you think about what a good person is, do your friends support you in that? Or do you feel like they encourage behaviors that you aren't proud of? Again, this goes back to what I talked about with regards to support. Ideally, you should be proud of the things that you spend your time doing, and you should be proud of the things that your friends support you in as well. Another question, do they respect the other people who you care about? So are they kind to your other friends or are they jealous when you hang out with them? When they come over to your house, and they talk to your parents or they talk to your siblings, are they respectful or are they rude? When friends care about you and they want you to be happy, then they support the relationships that you have that bring joy to your life and are important to you. Okay, so there are a ton of other questions that you could ask yourself that I'm not going to go into. I'm gonna cut this part of the activity off now. Um, but now I hope that whichever friend you were thinking about fits into all of those categories. If they do, they are probably a really outstanding friend, honestly. But I do want to make sure to talk about the flip side of that, which is what if they don't? So what if for some of those questions you were thinking, gosh, I really don't feel like my friend is supportive of my interests or wow, I just realized that I have a friend who I consider to be a really close friend who never really asks me questions about myself or shows interest in the things that are going on in my life. So that can be really tough to realize and you have options in how you handle that information. You don't have to like cut off the friendship immediately right now. So first off, what I would suggest is you go back to that first basic principle of healthy relationships that I mentioned earlier and think about, does this friendship make you happy? So overall, when you consider all of the great things about your friendship and also consider some of the things that aren't working so well, do you feel overall that this is a friendship that you want to continue having and that will continue to bring joy to your life. If that's the case, then I want to talk to you about how you can approach conflict with your friends and find ways of fixing aspects that aren't working well for you. So the steps that I'm gonna go through with approaching conflict um, are five steps. You wanna remain calm, you want to avoid blaming, and use I statements. You want to listen to other perspectives. You want to find the underlying issues and you want to give expectations and forgive honestly. 
So I'll go through each of those steps now so you can sort of see what that looks like. So to start, the first thing to keep in mind whenever you're approaching conflict is to do your best to remain calm and don't approach a conversation while you're still angry. So if a friend does something that makes you angry, you can take a step back, go for a walk, breathe, take a little bit of time for yourself so that you can calm down before talking to them. Because if you go into a conversation while you're angry, you might say something that you don't mean or that could be hurtful and you don't want that. That's not what you're trying to get across to your friend. So second, you wanna avoid blaming and you wanna use I statements. So you don't want to accuse the other person and put them in a defensive position. And a great way to avoid doing this is to use I statements during conflict. So specifically, um, when you're using I statements, you want to address the behavior and how you're feeling. So let's say that I told my friend a secret and they told someone else that secret. Um, and it made me feel really sad and angry and um, I am thinking of confronting them about it because it, yeah, it made me feel really bad and I want to talk to them. So if you're using accusatory language, it might sound something like, hey, you told someone else my secret and that was so mean. Um, I can't believe you did that. That really hurt. Okay, so the steps to approaching conflict that I want to talk about are one, remain calm. Two, avoid blaming and use I statements. Three, listen to the other person's perspective. Four, find the underlying issues. And five, give expectations and forgive honestly. So to start, the first thing to keep in mind whenever you're approaching conflict is to do your best to remain calm and don't approach a conversation while you're still angry. If a friend does something that makes you angry, um, you can take a step back, go for a walk, breathe, take a little bit of time for yourself so that you can calm down before you approach them to talk. Uh, if you have a conversation while you are angry, you might say something that you don't mean or that is hurtful, and that's not the purpose of this conversation. You're not trying to hurt your friend. Second, you want to avoid blaming and use I statements. So you don't want to accuse the other person and put them in a defensive position because that results in a conversation that's not effective. And a great way to avoid doing that is to use I statements during conflict, specifically by saying how you feel and addressing a behavior. So let's say that I told my friend a secret and they told someone else that secret and I didn't want them to. And it made me feel really sad and angry. So an example of using accusatory language, you might say something like, you told someone else my secret and that was so mean and I can't believe you did that. So pause. Can you imagine someone saying that to you? You're immediately put on defense, right? So you start to heat up. You might feel like you need to defend yourself. So that's typically not going to result in a great conversation. However, if instead you said something like, um, when I tell people secrets, I expect them to keep those secrets and not tell other people. And when my friends share my secrets, it hurts me because it makes me feel like I can't trust them. So think about that statement now. So with that, you're focusing on the impact that the behavior had on you. You're not focusing on what they did. Um, so ultimately, you're focusing on what you're trying to solve, which is the hurt that happened to you. Um, so Again, focusing on the issue at hand, not on the other person, it will result in a much more effective conversation. So now the flip side of this is now you need to be willing to have a conversation at this point and hear what the other person has to say. So step three is listen to the other perspective. So for instance, if in response to what you just said, your friend says, oh, I didn't realize that the secret you told me wasn't something you wanted shared. Well, then you have to think about that. You want to think about what they're saying to you and you want to come up with a response. You do not want to focus on winning the argument. You know, you should focus on communicating your feelings clearly, trying to understand the other perspective and coming up with a solution that works for both of you. So now, now that you're, uh, if you're interested in understanding the other perspective, that brings us to the next tip. So step number four, find the underlying issues. So there's often underlying issues or reasons that lead to conflict. 
And a lot of times miscommunication can come from the different experiences that people have had. So for instance, if they grew up in a different area or with different norms in their family. Um, with regards to our example, so let's say that when you tell your friend that you're upset about um, them not keeping your secret, your friend's response is, oh wow, like in my family, when I was growing up, um, we didn't really treat secrets that seriously. So if one of us knew something about someone else, it's basically just open knowledge. So I didn't think it was that serious uh, when you told me your secret for me to tell one of our other really close friends. So, you know, you can sort of start to see where they're coming from. So again, I'm not saying that this is a, a better system or that this removes any of the responsibility or hurt that this friend has caused, but it does move the conversation forward and it gives you the opportunity to understand where they're coming from a little bit better. So, um, one reason you might have been hurt was because you thought that your friend meant to hurt you by sharing your secret or that it was like really obvious that they shouldn't do it. But now that they've told you this, you might realize, oh, you know, they grew up in a different uh, different set of expectations. So I can sort of see where they're coming from. And, you know, maybe I feel a little bit less hurt now. So the final thing that you want uh, that I want to talk to you about with regards to dealing with conflict Step five is be upfront about your expectations moving forward and be honest about forgiveness. So sometimes people are able to bring up issues and start the conversation, but then as soon as they start getting into a real discussion, they, you know, sort of clam up and they just want it to be over as quickly as possible. So they say things like, oh, no worries, or it's okay, or oh, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. But if someone does something that hurts you, I want to discourage you from brushing it aside and just acting like it's a big some of the downsides of just like brushing aside when someone hurts you is one, your friend likely won't realize how much they hurt you. Two, they likely will not know what behaviors they can change to make sure that they don't hurt you in the future. And then three, you might start feeling resentment towards your friend when similar issues come up in the future. You might be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened again, again. But again, you didn't communicate to them. And so it's important to do that. So always important to have that discussion of what you want to happen in the future so that you don't get hurt again. And to be really honest with yourself and your friend about forgiving them. Don't just say you forgive them because it's easier and then ends the conversation. Yeah, so to summarize all of those steps one more time, just so that you have it really solidified in your memory, uh, you want to remain calm. You want to avoid blaming and use I statements. You want to listen to the other person's perspective. You want to find any underlying issues that are in there. And then you want to give expectations for the future and forgive honestly. So just one more thing that I want to leave you with uh, to help you have healthy relationships is that so far I know that we've only talked about these things with regard to how other people treat you. So we talked about some questions that you can ask yourself to figure out whether a relationship is healthy. And we talked about how you can approach conflict when someone else does something hurtful to you. Um, but I also wanna recognize that all of the relationships that you're in, all the relationships that anyone is in, involves the other person, but it of course also involves you, you know, and your behavior has impacts on others as well. So if you wanna do a little bit of an extra activity, you can rewind this video, you can go through all of those questions I asked you earlier, but now think about it with regards to how you treat your friends. So do you support your friends? Do you act in a way that makes your friends feel that they can trust you? Do you bring out the best in the people around you? Um, I wanna really encourage you to think about all of those questions. And if you feel that you have room for improvement, you're in luck, um, you can start today. There's no time like today to start being a better friend, being a better sibling, a better daughter, or even a better stranger. Um, so. Anyway, that is it for me. I wanna thank you all for listening to what I have to say. Uh, I'm super open to answering any questions that you may have and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much.